Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome back. Uh, so today we start with the first lecture of uh, Shlomo Razamat, <laughs> who is going to tell us about uh, four-dimensional uh, supersymmetric form, uh, quantum field theory, sorry. Yeah, and supersymmetry and geometry, sorry, right. I see there the yes. title as well. So thank you very much. I, I would want first to thank the organizers for organizing this meeting and for giving me the opportunity to present this set of lectures. So I will not be mainly in four dimensions, so the, uh, this set of lectures will move across dimensions, as we will see. So the general theme will be supersymmetry and uh, geometry. So it's great to be here in front of people and not of screens. So this uh, set of lectures will be based on a set of notes that uh, appeared on the archive uh, uh, half a year ago or so, and it is based on uh, lectures that I have given several times, but mainly on Zoom. So it's uh, great to have real people uh, in front of me, and I really encourage you to ask me questions whenever they appear, so stop me uh, at any time uh, uh, that you have questions. So let me start first with uh, some introduction, maybe a bit of uh, lengthy introduction to motivate and discuss what, what I'm going actually to tell you. Okay? And then uh, after we are done with the introduction, I will discuss what will be our plan, and we will uh, dive into the subject. So our goal will be to gain some understanding into workings of general quantum field theory. Okay? So what are the ways that we have to define quantum field theories at all? Okay, so there are various ways. So if you are a condensed matter theorist, so usually the way you would approach this problem, you will look on a lattice. Yes, and on a lattice you will place some spins uh, of uh, various kinds, and you will introduce some type of uh, interactions. Okay, you can have spins. You can have a Hamiltonian which governs this system. And in order to define a quantum field theory, this is just a quantum mechanical system. So in order to define a, a quantum field theory, you go to some kind of a continuum limit. You take a lot of spins, you tune some of the parameters, you go to continuum limit, and you get some effective quantum field theory. Okay, so it's a very well-defined way to construct a quantum field theory. You start from a completely well-defined theory of quantum mechanics, you take some limit, and you uh, obtain a quantum field theory. Another way, which is the more usual way that high-energy high physicists think about quantum field theories, is just as a theory of fields. So we have fields, various fields. We turn on, we discuss some type of a Lagrangian, which governs the dynamics of these fields. And uh, we do whatever we do, path integrals or canonical uh, quantization and so on, and discuss uh, dynamics of these quantum field theories. There is a third way of discussing quantum field theories. So man, let me mention it uh, also here, and it is very important in recent years. And it is more abstractly defined CFTs, or QFTs, abstractly defined QFTs. Okay. By this, one can mean several things. Okay. One thing that one can mean is not define the CFT in terms of some concrete lattice uh, formulation or concrete, concrete set of fields and Lagrangians, but say, uh, define the set of operators and correlation functions. Okay. And these correlation functions and operators have to, de to satisfy certain properties in order to construct for us a complete quantum field theory, or usually this approach is used to defining conformal field theories. And this is usually, this type of approach is, go, is going under the name of bootstrap. Okay. Okay. So we don't need to have the set of fields or, or a lattice to define quantum field theory. We can do it like that. Another way to abstractly define a quantum field theory is to embed it in a bigger structure. So what is a bigger structure you know? Don't be shy. I don't know what is the dynamic supposed to be, but it's almost like talking to Zoom when nobody attacks me. So, what is a bigger structure? A bigger structure that you know of? Strings. Strings. Okay, this is the name of this uh, uh, of this school. 
So you can engineer a certain uh, quantum field theories in string theory. Okay? How do, you how do you do that? There are various ways of doing that. For example, you can look on certain brain constructions on certain geometric constructions where you decouple gravity and in the end you have only uh, quantum field theoretic descriptions. In some cases, when you do these things in string theory, you obtain one of these descriptions, typically the field theoretic description. In other uh, cases, uh, you don't get a useful description in terms of fields. What string theory does for, for us, it predicts existence of certain CFTs, okay, or QFTs in more generality. We know some of the properties of this, uh, of this quantum field theories, but we don't know all of them. Okay? So this is a way to abstractly define quantum field theories. In particular, it predicts for us an existence of quantum field theories or non-trivial quantum field theories in higher number of dimensions, in five dimensions and in six dimensions, okay, where Lagrangian uh, constructions of quantum field theories of interesting, non-trivial, non-free quantum field theories simply do not exist. So this is a, a second way, and the third way, which is related to that, is a kind of a weird one. So we can uh, start from a theory which is uh, uh, infrared-free, okay? that flows to free theory in the infrared, and uh, the couplings grow when you go to the UV, and then usually we say we don't know whether this theory is defined in the UV or not, and we can conjecture that the uh, field theoretic UV completion exists. Okay. So somebody knows an example of this thing or where this appears? Okay. So an example, a canonical example of this type of thing is uh, quantum field theories in five dimensions. So it's, it's a highly non-trivial statement. We usually don't make it. If we have an infrared free theory, we are not sure what is the description in the UV. Okay, but in some cases, and again, this comes from string theory constructions, and we will discuss it a little bit in these uh, in this lectures. Uh, one can start from an infrared free theory in uh, five dimensions and argue that there has to be a UV completion as a conformal field theory direct in, in five dimensions. So there is some description of the theory directly in five dimensions, uh, but it is not the description of the theory itself, of the UV complete theory, but the, this field theoretic description gives us some kind of information about the fixed point that we will be interested in. Okay? So these are ways uh, one can think of uh, quantum field theories. So what we will do in this uh, set of lectures, we will not try to define the most generic quantum field theories, but we will study deformations of quantum field theories. Okay, so if I will give you a, a, a QFT, what can you do to it? Okay, I give you some quantum field theory and I ask you to produce uh, for me a new QFT. What would you be able to do? Uh, excellent. So one thing one can do is say I'm given, I, I, I have given you some quantum field theory. Let me call this quantum field theory X. Okay, and I can produce for you another quantum field theory that why I will denote to you by Y. Okay, and I can compute the correlation functions of this quantum field theory by just taking the correlation functions of quantum field theory X and deforming it by some uh, interaction. Okay, D, V, X. Okay, something like that. And this interaction might be relevant, might be relevant, or might be uh, marginal, or exactly marginal. If it is irrelevant in the flow energies, basically X and Y will be uh, equivalent. So the interesting cases is when this type of deformation is relevant or exactly marginal. Okay, so this is one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is uh, very similar. Instead of adding a deformation or adding a deformation, but also adding a new set of fields. Okay, in particular, if a theory X has uh, some global symmetry and we will denote it by G, then we can gauge some subgroup of that symmetry. By gauging a, a symmetry, I mean uh, introducing vector fields, coupling them to the concert currents in a proper way, 
So uh, that coupling will introduce some type of term, uh, some type of term like that into the action, but we also have additional fields, and again we produce a new theory. Okay, and that theory does uh, something for us. Another way which will be important for us that we can produce a new theory, uh, again I will denote it by y. So this so some way to compute new correlation functions in some new setup is to take the same theory x that we had, okay? Not introduce any term uh, in the action in the usual way, but uh, what we will do, we will uh, place the theory x on non-trivial geometry. Okay, let me call that geometry m, okay? So, for example, if you have a quantum field theory in six dimensions, you can place that uh, quantum field theory on two-dimensional surface. And then, when you go to low enough energies, if this uh, geometry is compact, your quantum field theory will appear as if it is a four-dimensional theory, and you can ask what that four-dimensional theory is. Okay? So it's not true that actually you don't introduce any terms in, into, the, into the action. You couple your theory uh, to geometry, so that will, geometry will appear inside the action, but it can appear in various ways, so I don't write it explicitly. So this is a general way how we can produce new theories starting from old ones. Okay. One interesting question, and that will be the main question that we will ask in these lectures, is what are these theories Y? Okay. Given a theory X, I deform it, say I understand the theory X, I can compute many things about this theory X, maybe everything, maybe not everything, and I deform it and I want to understand what is the theory Y when I go to low energies. Okay? This is one sort of question, this will be the main question we will address. Another question which will be always in the back of our minds and we will uh, get to it now and then, is that assume that theory X is complicated. We know something about it, but not much. For example, theory X is one of these more abstract quantum field theories that we can define. For example, we engineer it in string theory. We know something about, some things about it. It doesn't have a definition in terms of fields and Lagrangians. And what we actually want is not to understand the theory X itself. We don't want to understand the deformations of theory X, but what we want is to understand the theory X itself. Okay? And the way we will under, try to understand it is by deforming it in hope that after deformation, the, what we will get is a simple theory. And by understanding various deformations of our complicated theory, we will learn something about, uh, 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 about that theory, about the complicated theory. So why at all this question arises? Why it is complicated to understand these types of questions? So anybody has an idea? Okay, so here is a QFT1 okay, that I called before an X. I deform it and I flow with an RG flow to a theory Y. Okay, so there is some deformation. Let me call the deformation in general delta. So we say we do understand theory X, so we understand this theory uh, very well. So in particular, what we can do, for example, if this theory is weakly coupled, we can do some perturbative analysis of the physics uh, near this theory X in some sense. Why cannot we learn much about theory Y in general? Exactly, okay? So what happens usually, even if you start from a, a weakly coupled theory X, you turn on a relevant deformation, that deformation grows as you grow to, as you go to infrared, and then at some point you hit uh, problems with strong coupling. You basically have no idea what happens during the flow, okay? Uh, some strongly, strongly coupled dynamics happens, some, uh, your per perturbative expansion is not useful anymore, you don't know what, happen what is happening, and you basically have a wall between these two theories, the theory X that you might understand and this other theory Y that you want to understand, okay? And then one of the main problems in physics in general in quantum field theory is finding ways to go through this wall, okay? To understand given a theory X and given deformation, what happens deep in the infrared? 
Of course, we would want to understand what happens along the full RG flow. That's also an interesting question. But in these lectures, we will only uh, con constrain ourselves to answering this type of questions. Given x, what we can learn about the deep infrared, about the theory y. Okay? We will not want to c compute anything possible in this quantum field theory, in this deformed quantum field theory, but only try to understand the behavior of the physics in deep infrared. Many things can happen. For example, as we will see, the, the, the useful description of theory Y might be given in terms of completely different uh, degrees of freedom than theory X. Okay? For example, you, we might be able to define theory X in terms of certain collections of fields and interactions. And the theory Y uh, eventually will be also given by some weakly coupled description in terms of fields and interactions, but these fields and interactions will be completely different. So this will be our goal, to understand theory Y, if we understand theory X, and to bypass uh, uh, this uh, wall that we have uh, in, the in the middle. Okay, so what would be a solution to this problem? Okay. Or what type of solution to this problem we will be looking for? Okay, so we have here uh, theory X, which is deformed, and we flow to a different theory, theory Y. So there is some RG flow involved. So what we will want to do, we will want to find quantities that we can easily compute uh, in theory X. Okay? So this is an important thing. We will be lazy. Uh, we want to something which is easily computable in X on one hand. On the other hand, these quantities that we will try to compute, we will want them to tell us something something non-trivial about y. Okay, so this will be the, uh, the name of the game in what we are going to do. We will focus on theory x. We will try to find some quantities that we can compute for x. But these quantities have to tell us something interesting about the theory y. Okay, so let me give you an analogy. Okay, my drawing skills are very poor, but I will try to draw nevertheless. Okay, let me draw it here. So here is my impression of QFT. Okay, it is something like that. Okay, it's some animal, okay? This is a QFT. Uh, okay. I don't know, it looks like an elephant, right? No. It's not, not just in my head. Okay, so this is a QFT, it's a complicated animal, it has feelings, it has a lot of meat, it is very, very complicated, it is hard to understand what it is and what it thinks, okay? This is our theory why. So in what we are going to do, we are not going to try to understand uh, the elephant itself, but rather we will focus on the following object. Okay. Okay. We will look at the, in some sense, at the skeleton of the elephant, and I forgot an eye. Okay. Okay, this, is, this looks much less than an elephant, but nevertheless, it tells us something about the elephant. Okay? So the, the, when I draw this, uh, this animal, I mean okay, everything uh, in, in terms of QFT uh, information, like to define this animal and, and everything it does and thinks, I need to know everything about this quantum field theory. Nevertheless, the, there might be some very, very special properties, very robust properties of this animal, that I'm, I will be able to deduce by doing very little work somehow. Okay? Now, importantly, a skeleton is not an elephant. Okay? It's a dead elephant, best. Okay? But it tells me something about the elephant. For example, the skeleton doesn't have feelings, and this guy does have feelings. So by understanding um, the skeleton of our quantum field theories, we, we, are not, we do not hope to understand everything, but we want to understand something. Okay? 
by looking at the skeleton of some animal, you can deduce something about that. For example, probably this is not a snake, okay, when you look at it. Maybe you can think maybe it's a dog, maybe it's something else. If you are an expert in bones, maybe you can even deduce that it is some kind of an elephant, okay? But again, you will be able to deduce something, but not everything. Okay, so that's the basic philosophy of what we are going to do. And now let me discuss what type of bones we can uh, understand. Okay, so does anybody have an idea for a bone that we should focus on for a general uh, quantum field theory? Symmetries. Symmetries, excellent. It's as if I planted you into the crowd. <laughs> So let us consider symmetries, okay? So for example, let us start from QFT1, and, Q, and we want to get QFT2. And about QFT1, we understand something, okay? We have QFT1, and what we know about QFT1 is that it has some symmetry group G, okay? It has a set of local operators uh, on which some group acts. And in, mo in modern times, we don't need to focus only on local operators. There is a lot that can be derived also about extended operators, higher uh, form symmetries, higher group structures. I will not go into that in this talk. So when I will be discussing symmetries, it will be always vanilla and what is now called zero form symmetries that you learn throughout uh, your basic education. But again, this, this is not important. This, these statements can be generalized. So I know this uh, symmetry of, uh, of a theory in the UV of our starting point, point theory, which I already called by three names, theory X, QFT1, and the UV uh, theory. And now I'm asking what would be the, the what will be the symmetry of theory of QFT2, okay? So I want to understand a very, very simple question. What will be GIR? Okay, so what do you think it will be? Can I deduce the symmetry of the theory in the infrared by knowing the symmetry of theory in the UV? Okay, no, why not? Okay, Let's, let me also assume that this GUV is not just a theory of QFT1, but the theory which is preserved by, by the deformation I do. Okay, I start from a theory QFT1, I deform, and then I, I'm left with this symmetry. So for example, I add the term into the Lagrangian as I did there, and the term in the Lagrangian preserves some subgroup of the symmetry of QFT1, and I call it GUV by abuse of notation. So one option that can happen is that G infrared will be equal to GUV. Okay, this is a naive answer that uh, you probably will, might give. Okay, you, you have some symmetry in your theory. That symmetry is preserved along the flow, so you might assume that the theory in the UV will be the same as the, th uh, the symmetry in the uh, infrared will be the same as the symmetry in the UV. Okay. But the claim is that, that this is not the only possibility. Okay, there are two more possibilities. Okay, what are, what these possibilities are? Okay, so GIR might be, might be smaller than GUV. By, by comparing the, the groups, I mean uh, that it is some subgroup of G, the symmetry in the UV. How that can happen? I didn't break the symmetry. So why, where does the symmetry that I didn't, that was not broken, where did it go away in the infrared? Sorry? Okay, so think about, to understand this issue, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about this condensed matter way of thinking about, uh, about the physics. So what can happen? We don't break the symmetry. The symmetry is not broken. It is there in some sense. But what, what do we do when we go to infrared? We have this, uh, say we have a lattice and we coarse grain it and we go um, to low energies. And then it might be that in the end we have a symmetry but it doesn't act on anything. Okay, just there is nothing which is charged under that symmetry. Okay, this symmetry does nothing. It was not broken, but it just acts trivially on everything which survives in the infrared. Okay? So that's a possibility. The symmetry that we had in the UV might act non-trivial on everything, and it might be the same in the infrared, and the symmetry in the infrared might be the same, 
but the symmetry in the infrared actually might be smaller than symmetry in the UV, just because, you know, we can say it is the same symmetry, but if it doesn't act on anything, we can invent any symmetry that we want which doesn't act on anything. It will just be meaningless to say that the symmetry is the same. What is the third possibility? Symmetry enhancement, okay? So symmetry can be actually bigger in the infrared than the symmetry in the UV, okay? Again, think about your favorite lattice uh, theory where you can kind of imagine things happening. So you might think of a picture, right? Uh, some uh, complicated picture like that. You, you look at it, there is no symmetry. You go far enough from that picture, suddenly maybe some symmetries appear, some rotational symmetry, some translational symmetry. So the symmetries, when you go to low energies, might be bigger than infrared because, in a sense, you don't see all the details that, uh, that well from far away, okay, from uh, in low energy. Okay, so you see that the first thing that you would assume that would be a bone for our animal is the symmetry, but it's not very useful for us. By knowing the symmetry in the UV and also the symmetry that preserved by, by, which is preserved by certain deformation, we do not necessarily know what the symmetry will be uh, of our theory in the infrared. Okay? So this is, uh, this is unlucky. Okay? However, we can refine uh, our study of symmetry in one way. So what, what is a way in which we can refine our, uh, our study of symmetry? And this is something you typically learn in your quantum field theory classes. Okay, so if you have a, if you have a theory which has some a global symmetry, which I denoted by G, one thing you can do, you can compute a partition function of the theory and couple uh, and uh, introduce in this partition function uh, background gauge fields for this, uh, uh, for this global symmetry G. So compute any partition function you want. There are background gauge fields that you couple to your global symmetry. What does it mean to couple a gauge field, a background gauge field to global symmetry? Uh, you introduce these parameters into your theory. They are not dynamical fields. You don't integrate over them. But you couple them to conserved currents corresponding to your global symmetry. And you compute this object. Okay? Now you have a symmetry. And what you can do, you can act on these uh, background fields, background gauge fields with your symmetry generator. Okay. And here I will be a little bit schematic. Okay. By G, I mean some element of the group. You act on your uh, background gauge field with some elements of the group. And then you compute the partition function again. Okay. And then interesting thing can happen. Naively, when you have a symmetry, you would, uh, uh, you would uh, assume that these two partition functions are the same. <coughs> But they don't have to be the same in quantum field theory. Okay? So this thing is not always true. And when this doesn't happen, when the, uh, the partition functions depend on uh, your choice of, uh, of the gauge, on the, on the choice of the group elements in this way, you say that your theory has an anomaly. So that uh, there is some kind, some kind of anomaly, and you can quantify that anomaly. How do you quantify these types of anomalies? By the conservation of the torus? Say it again? Uh, by the conservation of the torus? Well, you can, this, a conservation of the current is broken, that's right. So you, you have a, an equation, conservation equation, which should be zero, and then on the right-hand side appears something which is built from various background fields that you turn on. And what is very important is that the, you know, this, uh, this thing that you can write on the right-hand side of the conservation of non-conservation equation multiplies some numbers. Okay, and these numbers measure the anomaly, the amount by which this, uh, this equality is broken to an inequality. Okay? And a famous example, again, uh, that you some of you, hopefully many of you, uh, have learned in your quantum field theory classes is this chiral anomaly in uh, four dimensions. Okay, how many mm, seen this thing? Okay, great. Okay, so you should speak up. You're not Zoom screens, you're people. 
remember that. Okay, so what, what does this diagram mean? Okay, so we can have various currents for various symmetries that we have. It can be the same symmetry, it can be different uh, symmetries. And inside this loop run various fermions uh, which are charged under this symmetry. Okay? And uh, if these types of diagrams are non-zero, or when we sum all over all of them, what do we have? In terms of this equality or inequality? Inequality, okay? So, and there is a very, very simple way to, com to parameterize this inequality. For example, if all of these symmetries are, are U1 symmetries, you just need to sum over all the fermions you have, that you have in your theory, okay? And weigh them with their charges. So say we have J1, current J1, current J2, and current J3. We sum over all the fermions with particular charges. And if this is not zero, we have an anomaly. If this, is, is, if this thing is zero, we don't have an anomaly. Okay. In particular, if we, have, if we are looking on the same U1, and we are computing, like all of these three guys are the same U1, and we're computing this thing, and we get that it is not zero, that means that, OK, we, we can discuss the theory that we have, but we cannot promote this symmetry, this U1 symmetry, to be a gauge symmetry. It looks like we have a good symmetry, but once we couple the symmetry to gauge fields, something goes wrong, okay? So another way one can phrase these anomalies is that the anomalies are some kind of obstruction to gauging, okay? Now, this is very important, so I just want to understand uh, how, uh, uh, again, you have seen this, and these words obstruction to gauging are familiar. Okay, so now why is this interesting? Okay. It is interesting because these numbers uh, that you compute, you actually compute them in the theory, uh, in the UV theory, in the theory QFT1 that I have written here. This is a very, very simple computation. This is basically counting. You just take your fermions, you weigh them with certain uh, integers, uh, and you compute this very, very simple uh, thing, and you you quantify your theory QFT1. But in a sense, you don't just quantify your theory QFT1, you also uh, quantify your theory QFT2. And the reason is that these anomalies are, are invariant under a normalization group flow. Okay? And the way you argue for that, well, there are many ways. So let me give you the old argument due to Tuft, okay? Tuft anomaly matching argument. By now, there are more fancy ways to argue that. And by now, I mean uh, back in the 80s already. But uh, the argument is very simple. Say you have a, a theory which, uh, for which you compute this type of triangle, say in four dimensions, in other dimensions, it is a different computation. You find that the theory has an anomaly. And you want to gauge that symmetry. What can you do? You cannot just gauge uh, the symmetry because it's anomalous, but you can remedy that. By what? Adding more fermions. Okay, just add fermions in any way you want, okay, such that their, their charges will be such that the, when you include them, also the anomaly, uh, the anomaly will cancel out and it will be zero. And then you can gauge the symmetry. But when you do so, you couple them very weakly uh, to the rest of the theory. Okay? And then in this picture, which I just deleted, you start from QFT1, you add to it extra fermions, and then you follow the flow. Okay? The Q, there is the QFT1 dynamics and this gauge dynamics. Okay? But you, you, the, the, the gauge coupling of this gauge dynamics is very weak. So under some assumptions, what happens is that QFT1 does whatever it does. It goes through that wall that we have drawn. There is something happening. It emerges on the other side. But for these uh, fermions that you added, nothing happens. Okay? They just go through the wall because the interactions are so small. You can uh, tune them to be infinitesimally small. So basically, they don't do much for your theory. The only thing that they do, they cancel the anomaly. 
And these uh, fermions that you added are often called spectators. Okay? They are just there to make sure that there is no anomaly. They don't do anything else. And then you get your theory on the other side of the wall, of the strong coupling. Okay? And now you decouple these fermions. Okay? Now, what happens to the anomaly? To the, the same anomaly that you have computed in the UV. What it has to be? It has to be? It, it has to be equal to the what you computed in the UV. Because all the way through the renormalization group flow, there was no anomaly. Okay? And the, the way there was no anomaly is because you canceled the anomaly with these spectators. Okay? Now but you remove these spectators from your discussion in the infrared. What remains has to be the same. It might be computed using completely different degrees of freedom, different fermions, but the number that you compute has to be the same. Okay? So that's the main, uh, the main thing of this argument, is that the anomaly is actually is one of these bones. Okay? And there are formal ways to write these anomalies. Okay? So let's say this bone is the anomaly. And again, what has to happen, let me call this general anomaly computation, let me quantify it by some quantity I will call i. And uh, this i encompasses all the anomalies that we can compute in the UV. The basic statement is that this i UV has to be equal to i IR. Okay? And you can think of this i as, uh, again, the collection of these numbers that you organize in some way. A neat way to organize these numbers is in terms of something which is called anomaly polynomial. We will get to that uh, later in these talks. But there is something you can do, and this something has to be equal between these two theories. So now let us go back to this discussion. Okay? We said that the symmetries are not good things, but now we are saying that anomalies are good things. And anomalies are, are somehow related to symmetries. Yes? That's right. Right. So what, what happened is that this gauge, you gauge the symmetry. The, the, the point is that the symmetry is, the, this procedure of gauging is well-defined all the way. Like once it is well-defined, it can, cannot go wrong in some way. So there is some gauge dynamics all the way. Since it's very weakly coupled, you know, you can, you have this, these fermions that you added that, that couple to the rest of the degrees of freedom. And the coupling is very weak. Okay, so it's there. Okay, so it's, it, you defined it in the UV, nothing is happening during the flow. And then in the infrared, you still have the same fermions, but they effectively couple to something, might couple to something else. But still, this coupling has to be well defined because nothing went wrong about with it like, during the flow. That's the argument. Okay. You can uh, ask in which ways this type of argument can go wrong. So obviously there are some assumptions, but this is a simple argument which nevertheless is correct. Okay, so let me look at this now, uh, at the picture of symmetries. So how this discussion we can translate into discussion of anomalies. Okay, so we say that always the anomalies have to match. Okay, but which anomalies? Okay. If the symmetry in the infrared is the same as the symmetry in the UV, then we have to have that this anomaly thing that we compute for GUV, okay? We have, uh, you, we have our symmetry in the UV, it has, uh, and we can compute these anomalies. These anomalies that we identify in the UV and in the IR have to be the same, okay? What happens here? If the, our symmetry in the infrared is smaller than UV, how can it be? If the anomalies stay invariant. Yes? Exactly. So then what happens is that, say, you preserve a smaller symmetry in the infrared than you had in the UV. Then the anomalies for the symmetry which you don't see in the infrared has to vanish. That's the only, only way it, it can happen. Okay? So the anomaly, let me write it schematically. Anomaly that you compute for, let's, let's write it like that, G 
U V minus G I R. Okay. Okay. That's just for the thing that you that you don't see in the infrared. This thing has to vanish. Okay. So then only way you don't see a symmetry in the infrared is if the corresponding anomaly vanishes. If the anomaly doesn't vanish, something has to be charged under that symmetry. Okay, this, this is one of the arguments that Hoof made in his seminal work, that if the anomaly is not zero, you have to see something in the infrared which carries that anomaly. Okay? What about the third case, when G infrared is bigger than GUV? What can you do? How that can happen in this anomaly discussion? Okay? So when G infrared is bigger than GUV, in particular, GUV is a subgroup of G infrared. So the anomaly for that subgroup has to match. Okay? So what you can say is that when you compute the anomaly in the infrared, like uh, the anomaly for the group GUV, which is inside this GIR, that you compute in the IR, has to match the computation you do in the UV. Uh, GUV, UV. Okay? But you don't know anything about the emergent symmetry. You have more symmetry here. It emerged. It, an, it can have some anomaly. It can have something. But it is a new symmetry which emerged. You don't know anything about it. Yeah, there is nothing to compare. Okay? So this is the basic logic. This is an example of a bone in this skeleton. Okay? This is something that can take us across this wall of strong coupling. Now, the title of these lectures is Sim Supersymmetry and Geometry. I'm talking already for 45 minutes almost, and there was no supersymmetry and no geometry. OK, so this, this is a, a thing you can do. And this thing of matching anomalies across this wall doesn't rely on anything fancy. It doesn't rely on having supersymmetry, your quantum field theory having some special properties. It's something you can always do. Okay? And for any theory, supersymmetric or not, you can compute one bone in a skeleton. But the point is that for non-supersymmetric theories, that's basically the only bone you can find. Okay? There are various varieties of these bones. And again, there is an ongoing research, of, again, of generalizing this picture to higher form symmetries, higher group structures, non-invertible symmetries, and so on. So it's looking for bones which are roughly of this kind. So you can find more bones of this kind, but you are very, very limited. Okay? So this discussion is very general. It, you can make it for any theory, not, not necessarily supersymmetric, but it is limited. And what supersymmetry gives us is more bones. Okay? For supersymmetric theories, we can find more quantities which can propagate through this wall, which we can exactly compute, which are not just uh, these hoofed anomalies, but they are more sophisticated quantities, and we can actually build a more interesting uh, uh, skeleton. The point about supersymmetric theories is that they are alive. Okay? They are not stones. They are not boring. Okay? You would say if there are many, many things that you can compute, maybe your animal is dead anyway. You know, there is no point looking at it. Okay? It's not... Uh, it's not something of the sort of the things that we see in real life. Okay, it's not, it's not similar to other quantum field theories, not supersymmetric theories that we can see. But supersymmetric quantum field theories exhibit very rich dynamics, which is very similar to what non-supersymmetric quantum field theories uh, do. And the added value of looking at supersymmetric theories is that we have this skeleton that we can, uh, uh, that we can discuss in detail. Okay? So that is why we will be interested in supersymmetry, to get more bones in this, uh, in this picture. OK. Now, what we will see in this uh, set of lectures. Okay, so this is the reason why, why we will be interested in uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory. So what kind of phenomena, what kind of uh, features or feelings or, I don't know, structures our animals will have. So there will be two interesting effects that we will discuss, highly non-trivial effects that we can see when you go through this wall in the RG flow. One, uh, one, this, one of these effects we already mentioned, 
And this is when the symmetry in the infrared is bigger than the symmetry in the UV. This is something surprising. This is something which is hard to predict in the UV, but we will nevertheless find various examples where we can predict uh, that this is happening using the magic of supersymmetry. So we will discuss this phenomenon, which is called emergence of symmetry. In some case, also emergence of supersymmetry uh, can appear, but we will not discuss that. Okay? Another thing that we will discuss is something which is called duality. A duality is another interesting uh, phenomenon, which uh, is uh, well known for about uh, 30 years in supersymmetric quantum field theories, and it's again extremely surprising. So we were discussing a situation where we have QFT1, we deform it, and it goes to QFT2 in the infrared. But what can happen is that there is another theory, let's call it QFT3, which is, comp which is very different than this QFT1. You deform it in some different way, but in the infrared, at low energies, they look exactly the same. Okay? The physics is exactly the same. There can be yet another theory, let's call it QFT4, which flows to the same theory. Okay? These theories, actually, QFT1 can say QFT4, do not even have to live in the same number of dimensions. Okay? It might be that we take QFT1, we deform it by some relevant deformation, we get QFT2, so we stay in the same number of dimensions. But we can engineer the same QFT by starting from a theory in higher number of dimensions and putting it on some compact manifold, and again, in low energy, we will flow to the same quantum field theory. Okay, so there are various examples of dualities, and we will discuss them in detail. Okay? And we will uh, see how we can understand or predict existence of these types of phenomena by looking at these skeletal properties of QFTs in the UV. So this is about supersymmetry. So where geometry comes into the game? The geometry comes into the game if we are not satisfied with this picture. Okay, we can build a lot of examples which exhibit a lot of interesting physics, but there is another question we want to understand. What is the other question we would want to understand? This is a very existential question. I will not move until you answer. <laughs> Ask one existential question. There is only one existential question in life. What was the question? What was the first word you said? Oh. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, this is an important question, but it's beyond me. No, something, uh, something less, uh, less concrete. The question I want you to ask is, starts with W, and it's just that question, why? Okay? So we will discover a lot of phenomena. There will be very scattered phenomena, and it will, will not be clear why this is happening. Okay? If you, you can study various types of quantum field theories. You can follow various types of uh, RG flows and discover various uh, dualities, emergence of symmetries, but it will be just random collection of facts. Okay? And what we will want to understand is why this is happening. What is the reason? Is there, is there some underlying principle? Okay? And that's where uh, the geometry will enter the game. Okay? So the geometry will work, we will see it very explicitly, but it will work in the following way. The way we will be able to engineer various types uh, of dualities, for example, let me draw the, the picture for dualities because it's easier to draw. So we have this QFT2, and say we have a duality in given number of dimensions where we have a QFT1 flowing to the same QFT2 and another QFT, which I will call QFT3, which flows to the same QFT. And there might be another picture that we can draw. There might be a QFT0, Okay, which lives in higher number of dimensions. And once we uh, pull place the theory Q of T0 on some Riemann surface, for example, on a genus 2 surface like that, okay, say it's a six-dimensional theory, and this theory is a theory in four dimensions, 
If we take this QFT0, place it on genus 2 surface, we get this theory, which eventually flows to, uh, to something in the infrared. On the other hand, we can place the same theory on, on a manifold which topologically is the same but looks differently. Okay? It will look like that. Okay? And then we will be able to argue that it flows to a different theory, QFT3. But these two geometries as geometries, they are the same. Okay, topologically, they are the same. The difference between these two theories will trans translate into some simple difference between the theories in the end of these flows. Okay, for example, the values of various parameters in the end of uh, exactly marginal couplings and so on might be different. But the theory that you will obtain in the end will be exactly the same. And the fact that we can predict that this theory QFT0, when we place it on this surface, you get QFT1, and when you place it on that surface, you get QFT3, the consistency of this picture, of this construction, will guarantee that these two theories have to flow to the same theory if we flow farther with the RG flow. Okay? And this picture can be ma made more and more complicated. And the emergence of symmetry can be explained in the same way. So the, the slogan will be that if the... the if uh, two theories are uh, dual to each other in various senses, there is some geometry behind it. There is a way to look on this duality to find some geometrical structure, which is basically the same, but we are just looking on it in a different way. And because we are do looking on it in a different way, we see something different, but deep inside it is the same. And in the same sen sense, emergence of symmetry will appear when in a proper sense, the geometry will allow for a bigger symmetry. Again, we're looking at something from a very skewed angle and we see less symmetry. But then if we look at it in the right way from the higher dimensional point of view, we will see more symmetry and that's what we'll explain. That. Okay, these are just words, but uh, we will make them very concrete. And another final picture I will draw before I will stop drawing pictures is the following. Okay, again, just an analogy of what we are doing. So say this is the set of QFTs that we want to understand. And we can, can place these QFTs on the line. So there is this QFT1, there is this QFT2, QFT3, okay? And we want to connect the, these QFTs. And what we said, there are some walls between these theories, some, say, peaks, some mountains, and if we're in this QFT1, we cannot see, we cannot really see how we connect to this QFT2. Okay, and we can continue drawing mountains in this way. Okay. What geometry will give us, it will give us some kind of aerial view of this picture. Okay, we will go to a bigger setup, we'll go to higher numbers of dimensions, where suddenly we will be able to see, wait a moment, there is a path winding through these mountains in some way which takes us from QFT1 to QFT2. If you are stuck here, you cannot see that path. Okay? But if you see uh, the, the big picture, if you see this geometrical picture, suddenly these relations between different theories uh, appear. Okay? So this will be our goal. Okay, this is a very, very lengthy introduction, but I hope it will be useful to understand things. Yes. That's right. So that's another way. So I, I will not care about that part of the story, but of course, th these things are interrelated. It's like everything you, you do, like supersymmetric quantum field theories are very rich in mathematical structures. Some of them are very well understood by mathematicians, some are not. And then making various uh, uh, predictions based on quantum field theoretic considerations on these mathematical structures they might be non-trivial. They might be, they are usually correct when physicists make them, make them. not always, okay? because the starting point is a big, a bit shaky. The, well, our power in quantum field theory is the path integral, which is uh, not good for mathematicians. Okay? And, but it is our magical wand that we can use, and we can deduce various properties of r rigorous mathematical structures, and again, sometimes they are new to mathematicians. Okay, that's not where I'm going to go. Okay, more questions? Okay, so let me finish this introduction just with the outline of uh, what we're going to do. Okay, so 
today we have this introduction that I already finished. And uh, I will follow it with uh, just definition of supersymmetry. Okay, maybe many of you have uh, know what supersymmetry is. But what I will do, I will discuss in detail what is called supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Okay. So this is a very elementary uh, thing. I will discuss it in, in detail. I will not do all the computations. So every hole in my computation, you should uh, fill, uh, fill by yourself. But this is really something that uh, all of you should be able to do. In lecture two, I will develop this tool of producing uh, these bones of the, uh, of the elephant that I have wiped out. So we will discuss the supersymmetric toolkit. Okay, or how one can produce all these different bones. Okay, the discussion will be, uh, again, very concrete. Here, again, I expect all of you to understand everything. It will be pedagogical. Here, the philosophy will be that I will present various results. I will explain where they come, but I will not fill in the details. Okay? I expect you to understand the, the physics, the ideas. And the idea will be that I will give you references, like the, the derivations, the detailed derivations will be one click away, in a sense. Okay? It's not, because otherwise I will not uh, get to anything interesting if I prove everything. Okay? In the end of this lecture two, and probably it will spill to lecture three a little bit, we will have a very simple toolkit, very limited. Like these anomalies, there will be another things that we can compute or we can say. And what we will do from that point on will be very systematic, very explicit, and we will derive various uh, results about RG flows, enhancements of symmetries and dualities using that toolkit. Okay? But again, pedagogically, this thing will have a gap that you will need, I, again, you will need to uh, fill in. The gap it will be not big, it will be one click away, and you should uh, ask me questions about that. Then uh, in lectures three and four, we will discuss strong coupling in dynamics, examples of strong coupling dynamics using all these tools. So we'll discuss various examples of uh, dualities, emergence of symmetries, very concrete examples where these things appear and how one can see that they are there, how to derive those things. And in lectures, Five and uh, five, six, and seven. We will add geometry to the game. Okay. And I don't have. Uh, there is this review that I have mentioned, so it has a lot of things. I, in principle, want to cover all of it, but I, probably I will cover less than uh, than the full review. But this will be the salient features of what we'll do. In geometry, one can say a lot of things. There are many examples, so I probably only cover a subset of those examples. OK, any questions about the introduction and the plan? OK, so let me start with, uh, let me stop drawing pictures and start doing some computations. So the first thing I will do, I will discuss uh, the basic idea of, of supersymmetry, the basic, uh, uh, the basic example of supersymmetry, which is supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Okay? It is an extremely simple topic, but there are a lot of things to be said about it, even uh, a lot of mathematics that one can derive. Again, we will not go there. So the starting point is like that. We start with a very simple Hamiltonian. So we, ha we are in quantum mechanics. We have a simple system where we have a Hamiltonian and we have a wave function. And the Hamiltonian looks like that. It's just your vanilla Hamiltonian. You have the kinetic term. And you have your potential, okay, which I will denote by V1x. And this multiplies, of course, psi of x. I will assume a couple of things about this Hamiltonian. First of all, I will assume that it has a ground state such that this h1 times this ground state is equal to 0, that the ground state energy is 0. A second thing that I will assume that for this ground state, 
something happens. What happens typically for a ground state? I will assume that this uh, eigenstate, eigen uh, wave function for the ground state doesn't vanish anywhere. Okay? So this will be my two assumptions, and with these two assumptions, I will be able to uh, do something very simple. First of all, a claim. If you have such a thing, you can easily deduce, given a ground state wave function, without knowing the potential, you can actually deduce the potential. How would you do so? You have this eigenfunction, you plug it inside here. This whole thing has to be equal to zero. You just uh, manipulate this simple equation and arrive at the fact that this potential V1 of x has to be equal to h squared over 2m, psi zero of x prime prime over psi zero of x. Okay? This is just simple algebraic manipulation. And here it is important is that this psi zero of x doesn't vanish anywhere in the region where your theory is, uh, where your potential is defined, okay? So this is uh, thing number one. Thing number two that I will do, I will try to factorize this Hamiltonian H1 in a simple way. I will de denote it as an operator, A dagger, times A, okay? Where A will be equal to H bar over square root of 2M ddx, plus some quantity I will call W of x, and a dagger will be minus h bar over square root to m d dx, plus the same function, W of x. Okay? Simple computation. Compute this uh, Hamiltonian, and these are the details you will need to fill in. Just plug in a dagger and a into this Hamiltonian and see what you get. What you will get is the following thing. H1 will be equal to minus h bar square over 2m, d square dx square. Okay, this comes from these two terms, and this is good. That, that's what we have here, and that's what we want. And then will be another term, which will look like, like minus h bar over square root of 2m, dw dx plus w square. Okay, so I want to write my Hamiltonian in such a way, and for me to be able to do so, Something has to happen. We have there a potential v1 uh, of x, and here we have something which looks differently. So what needs to happen is that this thing has to be equal to v1 x. Okay? So you have a, a simple differential equation. You are given v1 of x. You want to find w, which solves this equation. Okay? And this solution can be explicitly found if you know the ground state, for example. Okay? So. The solution is given by the following thing. Take w of x to be equal to minus h bar over square root of 2m, psi 0 prime of x over psi 0 of x. Okay? Just take this thing, plug it into this equation, look at v1, remember that v1 of x is given by this, uh, by this equality through the, the wave function, and you will see that this wx does what you want it to do, okay? So there is a solution. You can write h1 as a product of two operators, a dagger times a. Okay, this is step one in our construction. Step two in our construction is to define another Hamiltonian, okay? So we had one Hamiltonian h1, and now I want to define another Hamiltonian. Let me write it without a psi. What do you think I will do? Okay, exactly. So what I will do, I will just write, I will define an operator, a Hamiltonian, which is just built with the same A and A dagger, but in different order. Okay, this is one Hamiltonian, this is another Hamiltonian. Okay, you can compute this Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian will be given by minus H bar squared over 2M D squared DX squared. Okay, there will be the same term as, uh, as we had before. There will be a term which will look like minus h square, uh, sorry, it will look actually as plus h bar over square root of 2m 
w prime of x plus w square of x. So the difference between these two Hamiltonians is that we have a different potential. Okay, so we here we had v1 of x, here we have v2 of x, and the difference is this sign. We had a minus here and a plus here. An exercise, do this for a simplest potential you know. Okay, take, H, take v1 to be just a square well. Okay, what do you think will happen? What v2 will be? Okay. Say it again. Is it the same? No. So it will be something surprising. It will be something smooth. It will be one over sine squared, shifted. So do this computation, okay, and show that something interesting happens. Even in this very, very simple case, you get something non-trivial. V1 is trivial, but V2 is non-trivial. If you do it for harmonic oscillator, what do you think you will get? V1 is harmonic oscillator, x squared. Harmonic oscillator, nothing can happen. V2 will be also harmonic oscillator. Do this uh, also. It will be shifted by something, but it will be just harmonic oscillator. Okay, so these are two Hamiltonians. It's not clear why I'm, uh, why I'm doing this thing till now. But now be, uh, comes the reason. Okay, let me assume that I managed to diagonalize these two Hamiltonians, H1 and H2. That means that I found a set of eigenfunctions such that H1 psi 1 uh, of n of x, 1 labels the Hamiltonian, n it labels the eigenfunction which is equal to a dagger a times psi 1 of n of x. This is equal to e n of 1 multiplying psi 1 of n of x. Okay? I found these things somehow. And I also diagonalized h2. So I have psi 2 of n of x equals a a dagger psi 2 of n of x equals e n of 2 multiplying psi n of 2 of x. Okay? And now interesting thing happens. The claim is that this set of eigenfunctions of h1 and eigenfunctions of h2 are related to each other. How do we see that? Let us take one of the eigenfunctions of h1 and do the following. Okay? Let act with h2 on a, which multiplies psi n of 1 of x, okay? So we take h2 and act on, on it, uh, with it, not on psi 1, but on a times psi 1, okay? And let's write it explicitly. What we have here is a dagger, a, a dagger, which acts on psi n of 1 of x, okay? Because h2 is uh, a, 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 uh, h2 is, I messed up with something. I messed it here. Okay, so H2 is a a dagger, and I get this thing. But now I know what this thing is. Okay, this is by definition an eigenfunction of H1, so I can compute that. And what I get is that this thing is equal to E n1 of a psi n1 of x. Okay, so given an eigenfunction of the first Hamiltonian, okay, psi n of 1 of x, a sine 1 of x is an eigenfunction of Hamiltonian H2 with the same eigenvalue. Okay? And you can do it the other way around. Of course, there is a symmetry between these two problems, almost a symmetry. You can start from eigenfunctions of psi 2 and get eigenfunctions of psi 1. How would you do that? What you would do to eigenfunctions psi 2 to get eigenfunctions of uh, H1? You will act on them with a dagger. Okay? So here is the picture that we obtain. Okay? Let's draw the spectrum. Okay, so this is how the spectrum looks like. So we have the energies, and this is a, an artificial axis. We have here the Hamiltonian H1 and Hamiltonian H2. So what are the energy levels? So H1, we assumed 
has a ground state with energy which is zero. Okay? That's our assumption. Then there are other uh, energy levels. We don't know what they are. We assume that we solve the problems, uh, problem when we can compute them. Now we have the Hamiltonian H2. Okay? What we know is that we found, if we found these eigenfunctions, we can act on them with A and produce the eigenfunction of H2. Okay? We can act on all of them. Okay? And also we can go back by acting with a dagger. Okay, so this, uh, these states are paired. Okay, you go one way with A and another way with A dagger. Okay, all of this is correct except for the ground state. Why it is not correct for the ground state? Okay, what ground state satisfies? We take H1. We take H1, which looks like that, A dagger A psi, we, like on the ground state, say N is equal to zero, we act on that, we get zero. That in particular means that A acting on psi equals to zero. Okay? So we, the way we map between the, uh, the, uh, uh, the states of H1 and H2 is by acting with this A, but if we act on, with A on the ground state here, we get zero, so we don't get an interesting state. So all of the states are paired except for the, uh, for the ground state in this construction. Okay, so this is one thing I want to say. Till now there is no supersymmetry, nothing interesting, but there are, there is, there are a couple of Hamiltonians which are related to each other in some way. Now let us build a different system using this H1 and H2. Let me define a new Hamiltonian. Let me call it H. And that Hamiltonian will be a Hamiltonian for a two-level system. It will be like that, half. It will be H1 for the one level and H2 for the other one. Okay? And let us analyze this system. Okay? For, to do so, let us define new operators, which will be uh, interesting. Let us define an operator Q, which will be like that. It will be 0, 0, A, 0. Okay? And the Q dagger, which will be equal to 0, 0, A dagger, 0. Okay? And now you can just compute. And what you will find if, is if you compute an anti-commutator of Q dagger with Q, Okay, which is, let me be explicit, Q dagger Q plus Q Q dagger. Okay, you have these two matrices. If you have multiply Q with Q dagger, what you will get? Okay. What do you think this will be equal to? Okay, you have an A for Q and A dagger for uh, Q dagger. So do this computation, and what you will find is that this will be equal to twice H. Okay? There will be only terms on the diagonal, and there will be either A A dagger or A dagger A. Okay? So an interesting thing happens. Q dagger Q is equal to twice the Hamiltonian. Okay? Another thing that you can do is compute uh, what is commutator of Q with H. Okay, perform that computation as an exercise and you will get something simple. What do you think you will get? Don't be shy. Somebody whispers the correct answer. I heard a zero. Maybe it was a fluctuation over the vacuum. Okay, you will get a zero. Okay, what does this zero mean? We have some operator which commutes with a Hamiltonian. What does it mean? Which we, we have a concert charge. We have a symmetry. Okay. So now we can look on our Hamiltonian H instead of H1 and H2. And what is this concert charge? That's exactly what uh, A and A dagger did for us before. Q and Q dagger are basically A and A dagger dressed in this matrix form. 
So if you look on this Hamiltonian edge, it will have the same structure of eigenstate. There will be eigenstates paired in pairs if the eigenvalue is not zero. And the way you go from one to another is with which operators? With Q and Q dagger. Okay, again, this is just the same picture that we had before. Okay. So now we have a single uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, a single system with a very interesting algebraic structure. Okay. We have that the Hamiltonian is equal to Q dagger Q. This Q commutes with the Hamiltonian. And another thing that you can commute, compute is that Q anti-commutator uh, with Q is equal to something simple. What is it equal to? Zero, okay, just take Q squared, okay? This is immediate, Q squared is equal to zero. This is just twice Q squared. Q squared is zero, and of course also Q dagger squared is zero. So we get some very, very simple algebraic structure for a very, very, very simple quantum mechanical system. That's it, that's supersymmetry, okay? Any, anything else you will compute, any other system that you will encounter in your life which has supersymmetry, it's basically this. Okay, it's this dressed with various gadgets. Okay, you will have fermions, you have, will have more indices, we'll discuss that soon, but this is the basic structure. What you have here, in some sense, what you manage to do, this Q is, in a sense, square root of Hamiltonian. Okay, so you manage to take a natural square root of the Hamiltonian, and there is some natural structure to it. Okay? In particular, that structure implies certain degeneracy of uh, energy state. This is definition. Okay, that's a good question. This is definition. This is supersymmetry. Or more precisely, this is the, super, the basic supersymmetry algebra. Okay, this is just a definition. Okay. Why would it confuse you? Why is this, in what sense it's supersymmetry? If you're asking what, in what sense it is supersymmetry, you have something in mind what supersymmetry needs to be. So what do you have in mind that supersymmetry needs to be? Okay, very well. We'll soon get to that in some sense, but it's important to see here that there are no bosons and fermions. Okay? It's a more abstract structure. We can give some meaning of bosons and fermions to various things. We will do so soon, but you don't have to do so. Okay? You, ha you can go to this quantum mechanics and uh, discuss supersymmetry there. Importantly, usually when we will discuss supersymmetry, there will be some bosonic charge that we take a square root of it in this sense. Usually that bosonic charge is related to one of the Poincaré charges, but it doesn't have to be so. Okay. The super, once you discover such a structure, you have supersymmetry. What appears on the right-hand side might be some combination of bosonic charges. It doesn't have to be the Hamiltonian. It doesn't have to be something else that you like. It has to be some bosonic charge and that you manage to build such an algebra for it. Okay, now let me go to bosons and fermions. Okay, there are no bosons and fermions here. But let us declare that these are bosons and these are fermions. Okay. These are just names. Okay, you can of course do the other way around. Okay, it's quantum mechanics. We don't have to have bosons and fermions. Okay, let's declare these things to be bosons and these things to be fermions, okay? And then what do, do these operators Q and Q dagger do? They take us between bosons to fermions and between fermions to bosons, okay? So let us define an operator, which I will denote by minus one to the F, which is called a fermion number. It is one for bosons and minus one for fermions. Okay, so what is the charge of operators Q and Q dagger? What is the, the, this fermion number of Q and Q dagger? Minus one, right? Because it changes this number. If you are a boson, 
you act with the, one of these things, you either get a fermion or there is other thing that you can get. What, uh, what is the other thing that you can get? You are very shy with zero. Usually answers to my questions will be zero. <laughs> okay? So because Q squared and Q dagger squared are zero, okay? You, if you have an one, one object, you can, if you act once on it with Q dagger, for example, say you, you started from a boson, you get a fermion, you act second time with Q dagger, you will get a zero. Okay? If you act with a Q, you go back to, to being a boson. Okay? So now there is the main reason why this, uh, the supersymmetry is so, uh, is so powerful. Let me now consider the following quantity. Let me take uh, an abstract system. We, we built this system, this supersymmetric algebra, using a very, very concrete construction in quantum mechanics with its H1 and H2. But now let me be more abstract. Let me say that I have some quantum mechanical system which has a Hamiltonian which satisfies this property, that there exist operators Q and Q dagger such that this happens. Okay, and uh, that Q dagger Q anti-commutator gives twice H, that Q square is zero, and that H, Q commutes with H. Another exercise you can do, don't assume that. Assume just that Q dagger Q is equal to twice H and Q squared and Q dagger squared are equal to zero. You can derive these two things from there. Okay, it's a simple exercise you can do. Okay, say we have this, uh, this algebra, this some uh, abstract quantum mechanical system with this algebra. What it immediately will imply, again, that the spectrum will have this structure, okay? This, we have a symmetry, each state, each state with non-zero energy will be degenerate, and uh, no, the degeneracy of ground states uh, is not required, okay? We can have maybe many bosonic ground states, many fermionic ground states, but they don't, they, their number doesn't have to be equal, okay? By the same logic that we discussed before. Another exercise that I want you to do, there are many exercises, let me just say it in words. If you have a system with this algebra, prove that uh, the energies of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian have to be uh, non-negative. Okay? Another simple exercise that you have to do, so you cannot go below zero here. And now let me uh, define the basic hero of these lectures, okay? one of the basic heroes. Let me trace over all of the, um, uh, of the, over Hilbert space of my problem, let me sum over all of the energy levels, energy eigenstate of, uh, of our system with minus one to the F as the weight. What do you think I will get? So I sum over all the, the eigenstates of my Hamiltonian with the weight which is minus one to the F. So what will happen? If the energy is not zero, what will happen? The answer to all my questions is zero, okay? So you, why it is zero? You have one state, then you have another state with the same energy, but it has a opposite, a opposite fermion number. So all the states will cancel out, okay? If you are a mathematician, you should complain. Why you should complain? If you are, there are no mathematicians, okay? So it is like infinity minus infinity equals zero. It depends how you count, but that can be remedied. How that can be remedied? Well, that's, that's why you are not mathematician, probably. <laughs> Right, so the mathematicians will say, no matter how you sum, you have to uh, get the same number, right? So what should I do? I somehow need to make this sum convergent. How do I regularize it in a natural way? I just define a different object. E to the minus beta H. Okay, let me do this thing. I trace where the weight is minus one to the F. Then I weigh, weigh every state with such a thing. So every state will be weighed with its energy. Energies are no, are no negative. So this number, when I go up, it becomes smaller and smaller. 
But importantly, between two states that I want to cancel, this number is the same. Okay? So still, things which have non-zero energy, they cancel out. The result will depend on beta or will not depend on beta. Again, the answer to my question is zero. In this case, uh, zero is no. So it will not depend on beta because for each state for which EH is not zero, okay, they will cancel out. The only place where they won't cancel out is maybe for the ground states, number of which doesn't have to be the same. So the answer to this question, to this computation, is basically the number of bosonic ground states and again, these are not really bosons in the sense you, you know. The number of states on the left minus the number of states of the right is the answer to this computation. Okay? Bosonic ground states. Okay, so it's a, it's a, you sum over all the spectrum of your theory, but in the end what matters are only the ground states. Okay, this computation or oh, this thing is called an index. A Witten index. It has a name. It is called the Witten index. Okay? And this is the power of supersymmetry, of crossing these walls, going from one side of renormalization gr group flow to another. So let me explain why. Yes? So the Well, it's minus one to the F. So it's like it's uh, minus one for the fermions and, uh, and one for the bosons. Okay, so why is it useful? Why is it useful to cross walls? Okay, let me look on, the, on my Hamiltonian and say I have some Hamiltonian and it is defined using various parameters, alpha one, alpha two, and so on. There are many, many parameters which define the Hamiltonian. I now start uh, tuning these parameters without breaking the structure of supersymmetry. So for any value of these parameters, still I have this algebra. What will happen to the ground, to the, to the energy levels? Okay, they will start move, moving around, right? So they, their, their value will, the value for, of the energies will probably depend on these parameters alpha i. So they will start moving. Some will move up, some will move down. But something important will happen. Is this movement completely arbitrary? Okay, they always need to move in pairs because I didn't break this structure, okay? So I start moving the things around, they move in pairs, what happens? The width and index doesn't change, okay? So what can happen is that the, uh, the states with non-zero energy, they still move in pairs, so they still contribute zero. A pair of uh, excited states, of states with energy which is not equal zero, can suddenly become ground states, but they do so in pairs. So they will not change this number, okay? And another thing that can happen is that, that a pair of ground states can move up, okay? But again, this number will not change, okay? So we have here a quantity which is very robust. It doesn't depend on small properties, on varying various continuous parameters. And in, uh, in our application of these types of formalism to renormalization group flow, we will devise exactly these types of Witten indices, which don't depend on RG flow. Okay, this is yet another counting problem you, that you can easily do. No matter what happens in the, you know, in, in the middle of renormalization group flow, things will be able to move up, move down, move to be ground states in certain sense, but very particular numbers will remain the same. Okay, and what will be interesting in our computations is that th this will not be stupid numbers. We'll be able to deduce from them certain very physical properties about our system. For example, one thing that we'll be able to do is by, from the value of these numbers, which will not be just numbers, but be some characters of some, uh, uh, of some groups and so on, we'll be able to deduce what is the flavor symmetry, the global symmetry of the theory in the infrared. This, uh, this is to come. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, great. Okay, so in the next 15 minutes I will do something very quick. Maybe I will not manage to do so, all of it, but let me try. So 
our discussion was completely uh, Hamiltonian, right? We started from a Hamiltonian quantum mechanics. We derived some algebraic structure, and we, we, we have seen what it implies. In particular, we have seen that there is some symmetry. Okay? There is some uh, charge that we have which commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay? And we deduced some implications from that. Uh, our, one nice uh, thing to have when we have a symmetry is to understand it more geometrically. Okay, what is that symmetry? Okay. In Hamiltonian picture, many times understanding a symmetry as a transformation of some, something is, uh, is hard. So uh, a good way to do so is to go from Hamiltonian formalism to Lagrangian formalism. And that's what I will do next. Okay. So I will write the same system in Lagrangian formalism. Okay. So to do so, uh, I will need to remind you something about uh, Grassmannian variables. Okay. I will need Grassmannian variables. In a sense, this is how uh, fermions are hidden in the discussion. We need the Grassmannian variables to write a Lagrangian. And the Grassmannian variables are anti-commuting sets of formal variables such that, say, if we have two such variables, psi i and psi j, they are equal to minus psi j psi i. This is one thing that they satisfy. Another thing that they satisfy is that I can integrate over them. So if I integrate over this formal variable psi and the integrand is 1, what is the result? 0. Okay, this, this is the definition of this integral. Okay, now comes something which is not, this is exception to the rule. This is one, okay? And you can generalize this thing. So if you have many Grassmannian variables, you can integrate over all of them. Okay, so if you have less variables than integration, what will be the result? Zero, and it, if it is exactly the same, it will be one uh, or minus one, okay? You need to be careful with ordering. You need to choose some way of order of, to define, for example, the deep, it, it's part of the definition. So you, you define the deep psi one, deep psi two, say psi two, psi one, this is equal to one. Then if you change psi one with psi two, you will get a minus one. So it's a matter of definition. You need to choose a definition and to stick with it. Okay, so I assume you, you've seen Grassmannian variables before. So now here is the statement. Let us define an action which will have the following form. It will be integral of dt, L of x, psi, and psi bar, where psi and psi bar are complex uh, Grassmannian variables. You can think of them as psi equals psi 1 plus psi psi 2, and psi bar is equal to psi 1 minus psi psi 2, where psi 1 and psi 2 are the usual Grassmann variables. And the Lagrangian that you, uh, I will write has the following form. It will be equal to half x dot squared plus i over 2 psi bar psi dot minus psi bar dot uh, psi minus half w squared x plus psi bar psi w, function of x. And this w is the arbitrary function of x. Now you can do various things. Some things I will do, some things I will not do. If you have a, a Lagrangian and an, ac and an action and everything, how can you connect to the Hamiltonian picture that we had before? What you need to do? You do Legendre transform, you canonically quantize, you find canonical momenta for all the variables, you quantize. The claim is that you will get exactly the same type of system that we had before, okay? This is an exercise which is simple. It's not completely trivial because you need to be careful with the canonical uh, uh, momenta for the Grassmannian variables. So we need to, to work a little bit. Uh, um, again, it's not something that you usually uh, have done, so you need to be careful with that. But as, assuming that you can do that, you can, uh, you can show that the two systems are the same. Another thing you can do, you can look on this action on this Lagrangian and ask what are the symmetries of this Lagrangian. Okay. And here I claim that the symmetries are the following. You define a certain Grassmannian parameter epsilon, which is complex. Again, it is equal to epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2. And epsilon bar is equal to epsilon 1 minus i epsilon 2. These are definitions. 
And then you define the following transformations. You take your variable x, which appears there, and you uh, define that the transformation of that variable with epsilon is like that. De delta epsilon of x is equal to epsilon psi plus psi bar epsilon bar. So x is a usual bosonic variable, is a usual number. Epsilon uh, are uh, Grassmannian numbers. Psi are Grassmannian numbers. But if you multiply two Grassmannian numbers, you get something which is not Grassmannian. Okay? So this is the, the, the change in x. There is a change in uh, psi, which is minus i epsilon bar x dot plus i omega of x. And delta epsilon of psi bar which is i epsilon x dot minus i omega of x. Claim these transformations are symmetries of this section, which is written there. Show that. Okay, if you never did that, show that. Again, showing that uh, doing canonical quantization of this thing is not a trivial exercise, not completely trivial. It's simple, but not completely trivial. Uh, it that will not buy you much in terms of education, but doing this, seeing how this works, these transformations are symmetries of this action, that they don't change an action. This is something that uh, I really encourage you to do, if you didn't do it, do it before. Okay? And what this transformation do? This transformation do what you usually hear supersymmetry should do. Okay? It takes a bosonic variable, x, and it mixes it with Grassmannian variable, psi. And it takes a Grassmannian variable and mixes it with the bosonic variable x. Okay? And it does it in a non-trivial way. Okay? There is this function w which appears here. Okay? Is the statement clear? Okay. Another thing you can do, another question you can ask. Okay, there, is the, there are these symmetry transformations. And say that you believe me that they, they are symmetries of this action. You can ask how that symmetry transformations are related to this algebra. Okay? To, de to derive algebra of, tr of transformations from symmetry transformations, what do you need to do? The answer is not zero. Let's do the following thing. Let's commu compute a commutator of two transformations. Okay? Let's take delta epsilon 1 and delta epsilon 2 and say, let us act with these epsilons on, on one of our basic fields, let's say x. Okay? So how you do that? Okay? So this is just delta epsilon 1 of delta epsilon 2 of x okay? minus delta epsilon 2 of delta epsilon 1 of x. Okay? The definition of these delta epsilons are written on the blackboard. <coughs> so it is a computation. Perform this computation, and what you will get in the end, that the result is epsilon 1 times epsilon 2 bar minus epsilon 2 epsilon 1 bar twice i d d x, sorry, d d t times x. What is this thing on the right-hand side? What is I D D T? This is the Hamiltonian. This is what the Hamiltonian should do. What, what you obtain is that if you commute two transformations, you get the Hamiltonian. Okay? Now let us connect this, uh, this observation. <coughs> Sorry more intimately to this definition of the algebra. To do so, let me define uh, operators which generate these transformations. Okay? So what I will define is that delta epsilon formally is given by epsilon, this number, times some generator Q, minus epsilon bar, a, a dagger of the generator. Okay. This equation defines what Q and Q dagger are. Okay, this is a definition of Q and Q dagger. And now what you can do, you can compute, perform the same computation 
but with this definition. Okay? So the generic statement of these types of computations, where you start from x, from psi, or from psi bar, the statement will be is that delta epsilon 1 commutator with del delta epsilon 2 is equal to uh, the following thing, epsilon 1 epsilon 2 bar minus epsilon uh, 2 epsilon 1 bar uh, twice the Hamiltonian. Okay? So this is an example of this computation. You can perform it also for psi and psi bar, and you should get the same, and that will be the statement. Now you can take this definition and start commuting these operators, these transformations with operators Q and Q dagger. Okay? Again, compute these commutators, delta epsilon 1 and delta epsilon 2, but now instead of using the, the explicit transformations which are written there, write the transformations with Q and Q dagger. What will you get? Okay, what will you get on the right-hand side? Qualitatively, not uh, with all the numbers. Okay, there will be a term which will be proportional to epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Okay, what will it multiply? It will multiply something which will look like QQ. Okay, or Q squared. QQ is a bit of an overkill. And then what you will want to do is the following. You look what you get here, you will have other terms like epsilon 1 bar, epsilon 2 bar, which will be proportional to Q dagger, Q dagger. And you will get some combination of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 bar and epsilon uh, uh, 1 bar, epsilon 2, which uh, in the end of the day, they will be proportional to Q dagger, Q. Okay? And then you equate what you got here to what you obtained in the explicit computation. Is there a term here which is proportional to epsilon 1, epsilon 2? No. Okay? There is epsilon 1, epsilon 2 bar. There is only one with unbarred and one barred variable. Okay? So these two terms have to be zero. So this is a definition, and this definition has to satisfy whatever the transformation satisfies. By these rules, you will find that QQ Q commutator, anti-commutator is zero, the same Q dagger, Q dagger. And by the same logic, you will find with exactly the numbers which appear here, that the commutator of Q dagger Q is equal to twice the Hamiltonian. Okay? So these are the generators of your symmetry transformation, and they give you exactly the same thing which appears here. Is it clear? These last 10 minutes are a bit fast. Okay, I think it's a good point to stop for today. I didn't finish everything I wanted to finish, but I will ex accelerate exponentially, and I think it's not good for anybody. So let's continue from here next time.